Hey guys, and welcome back to part three of the mini bike build. And we're going to start off this video by turning our attention to one of these wheels. And we have to figure out how we are going to mate this to this and have it spaced just far enough out to where the chain clears the tire. So we'll start off by getting this wheel apart. All right, and the whole thing is held together by five, five sixteenths bolts. So I'll just use a socket on one side to hold and just get these out of here. Now, let's figure out what we need to do here. All right, I went to the hardware store and picked up five 5 16 bolts that are all thread and three inches long, and a bunch of lock nuts and washers. So, here's my idea. I'm going to use a washer and one of the lock nuts, I'm sorry, lock washer, that came with the wheels on one side. Poke that through. And on this side, we'll use another washer and a lock nut on this side. Get this tightened down. All right, well, my socket is no longer long enough to reach that, so I need to switch to an even slower tool. All right, I'm just gonna hold this side with a wrench and Crank it down from this side. Well, that took absolute ages. I'm going to put in the rest of these with a power tool. An air tool to be exact. Okay, so the next idea is to measure up from here and cut spacers out of the, uh, I believe it's 5 8 tubing that I have to slide over here that will elevate the sprocket at the right level during matching holes in the sprocket fasten it down. The trick will be getting the spacers exactly flat and then whether or not this whole thing wants to twist once we've done that or if the sprocket itself will also provide some strength as far as the, the bolts wanting to wobble around. If worse comes to worse I could always just weld something in here to the spacers so that way it keeps everything all straight and not being wobbly or anything like that and the biggest concern will be marking in this where the holes need to be drilled because the holes that come in it absolutely none of them line up for this purpose and getting it dead center with the axle so yeah just that stuff all right if I lay a straight edge 
across the tire. It's going to hit at the part that sticks out the furthest. And then I can take a measuring tape and measure from the surface of the wheel, the rim, how far out it comes where the edge of the tire is. And that gives me an idea of how far up I need to come away from the edge of the tire for it to clear the chain. And it looks like it comes out about an inch and five eighths or so. So if I made my spacers two inches, it should give me plenty of clearance for the chain, but I'm thinking I'm gonna actually come a little below that and go to an inch and seven eighths. Because if I need to move the sprocket out a little bit, I could always easily do that just by adding an extra washer underneath the uh, the lock nut because the spacer is sized just so that it fits and not on the surface of the wheel but on the surface of the washer so I would rather cut a little under and have the option of bringing it out a little bit easily as opposed to the opposite of that which would be a pain in the butt so I think I'm gonna go with a inch and seven eighths and see how that turns out All right, so to make my spacers, I've got this piece of uh, galvanized conduit, actually. And I'm going to use not just a measuring tape, because that would be pretty inaccurate. I've got a little machinist ruler here. And I'm going to mark this at 1 and 7 eighths, just using a pencil. All right. Now, I know that mark isn't probably very accurate, but I'm going to take this to piece of green tape and go on it and then measure to the tape because I can actually see what I'm doing now. And I've actually got that right on an inch and seven eighths. So now I'm going to take this over to the saw and get it cut. So now I can actually see what I'm doing. Sparkorama! Alright, now I'm going to get this guy cleaned up around the edges to kind of deburr all this funk off of there. Now I just got to repeat this whole process four more times. Alright, I got all five of my spacers now. And they're probably about 97% completely flat and matching. I need to deburr the inside of that guy. Alright. I don't have actually a whole lot of confidence that these are all completely exactly 100% the same, but I figured I could go ahead, get everything cut out, get the holes drilled in the sprocket, get everything put together, and then actually just sight down the side of it and see where it's got any sort of wobble or anything, and then just take care of it then, as opposed to just trying to level everything off and not really knowing what I'm doing or which one is the way I want it. So basically this is just kind of proof of concept and then we will try to make everything really accurate after the fact, after we've test fit. So I already know that none of these holes are going to line up with this other wheel over here so I took apart my second wheel, the front wheel, and I'm going to use one of these rims as a pattern, but the tricky part is going to be getting this exactly centered, lined up with the hole here because they're not exactly the same size. The wheel rim is just slightly larger and I don't know if I want to distrust eyeballing it, looking down in there and trying to get it to where it's an even amount of sprocket showing 
or if I want to figure out how I could measure that and get it more accurate that way, which is going to be hard to do because it's not completely flat on the bottom. It curves in right there. So yeah, I just got to figure out how I'm going to do it. All right, so I ended up just kind of eyeballing it after all. And to the best of my ability, I think I've actually got it probably within between a 16th and a 32nd of an inch, which uh, I think might actually be okay, especially if there's any adjustment at all after I drill the holes to, to move things around if need be. Now my main concern is I need to be able to mark these holes and I can't see what's going on underneath and I of course don't want to have any holes drilled you know right next to some of the holes that are already in it so I'm just gonna take a leap of faith here and take a green magic marker and just go to the center and put just a little dot very tiny in the center of each one of these holes and then lift this up and see just how close I am to the holes that are already in there. Now I know these marks are going to be practically impossible to see on camera because they're just barely visible. I can see that this one right there is kind of an open area and it's fine as well as this one. This one I think I can live with that one's awfully close to this hole right here and so is this one so I just gotta stare at this for a second and figure out how I can rotate it to where I've got kind of a, a decent distance away from these existing holes on all five holes it's looking like if I put the rim on there and remark it and just barely turn it that direction I should have enough space that I can live with. I'm never going to get these two, I think, far enough away from these holes to make a, a huge difference. I think I can improve it a little bit, though, because if I turn it too much, I'm going to end up having these that are down here that are pretty far away getting closer and closer to the holes. So it's kind of a give and take, and I just got to find a happy ground in the middle. All right, I got this lined back up there again and got it lined up with those little green dots that I made and I rotated the whole thing clockwise about half a hole. So hopefully that'll give me enough room next to the holes that are already in the sprocket that they're not extremely close together. And I went ahead, since I'm going to be painting these wheels, uh, I went ahead and got the stickers off of here and went over that with some uh, goof off to get rid of the residue and went ahead and scuffed everything up because I want to be able to mark these holes without moving anything around. So I'm gonna do that by going ahead and misting them with some primer. Since I'm planning on painting these anyway, I'm gonna kill, I guess, kind of two birds with one stone a little bit, not really. But that way I can get these holes marked without having to uh, go in there with a pencil or something like that and possibly knock it off of where I have it lined up. This is the theory anyway. And there are my holes. And I knew no matter what I did, I was gonna have kind of an issue with these holes right here uh, being too close or not too close but very close to the holes that are pre-existing but what can you do all right I scribed some little plus signs on these and just basically eyeballed it and then I took a punch and put a dimple at the center of each hole so now I'm going to take it to the drill press and see what happens.
Now for the moment of truth. Well, it fits. Now we're just gonna make sure that we get it completely level. All right, I got everything bolted up. I ended up having to use, well, I put washers on all the bolts on the back side of the sprocket, but I had to add extra washers on some of the bolts just to get it to where it was actually level because apparently I didn't cut my spacers very accurately. But now I'm just gonna go stick it on the bike and see what we got to work with. get out before final assembly because I don't want the the chain jumping off of there but it looks like it's gonna line up with the pulley on the engine pretty good so I guess I just need to get a chain on there and get this engine actually bolted down for the pulley, so I'll go ahead and cinch that down so it's not moving around. Now the first thing I gotta do to get this chain on there and the correct size as well is get this master link off. I'm gonna try to use these snap ring pliers to open this up and then use the screwdriver to push it off. Or at least that's, that's the plan. We'll see if it actually works. Ah. Ah. Aha. Let's get in there and pull that out. And make sure that I don't lose it. That would be detrimental. So now we just got to get this top part of the link off there. Quit being difficult. Oh, I'm off one side. There. Jeez. It seemed like it was a lot harder than it should have been. All I gotta do is slide this out of there. And now we can use a tool to remove some links. But first we need to stick it on the bike and see what length it needs to be. All right, I've got the chain laying across the sprockets, but the first thing I need to do before I make it the correct length is make sure that this engine is pushed back as far as it can be and then remove the links to make the chain the correct length so that way we can have plenty of room to move the engine forward to tighten the chain up. Unfortunately I actually had to completely remove the carburetor because the float bowl was hitting on this frame rail right here where I couldn't hardly move it back at all. So I'm gonna have to do all this with the carburetor off and then get it to where I can tighten it by pushing the engine all the way forward, then put the carburetor back on. A little bit of a pain, but so long as it works, I'm okay with it. Now, we can go ahead and see how much of this we're gonna have to remove. I want to leave a little bit of slack in it because I know I'm going to have to move that engine forward quite a bit to clear the carburetor. So it looks like maybe at this link 
right here. I'm going to try to wipe some of this grease off of here and use this magic marker to mark where we want to remove the link. It's not marking great, but it's kind of at least tinted it green right there where I can see it. I can mark it better once we get it off here. All right, let's see what we can do with this guy. Let's move to this one next to it. All right. Now we got that coming off. Just push that through. Maybe. All right. Our length of chain is removed. Now we just got to put it back together with our master link. Right, so now I have the master link pieces here. So all I gotta do is put this through here, put on the top link. Ah, my hands are so greasy now. Settle that in with a screwdriver and a little tack on my hammer. Looks good to me. Now we just got to get our clip on here. patience and I don't want to sit and wait for another master link to get here and order one so I'm going to take this back apart eh, I have a tool for it might as well use it Just need to bash on it with something a little harder underneath it like the concrete floor and can you tell which one I replaced me neither all right so that wasn't that big of a deal I just had to take the wheel off the the band brake and the pulley so I could get the chain on there and I would call that a result of course I can always pry forward on the engine whenever I tighten it down to get the some of the slop out of the chain. I can still go, go forward maybe a little over an eighth of an inch maybe, which would be just right. And more importantly, it clears the carburetor. I'm gonna have to get a measuring tape in here on both sides and take some measurements so that way I can make a spacer to go on this axle to keep the wheel in the center. I'll have to do the same thing for the front as well. For right now though, I'm gonna get both wheels apart and go ahead and start scuffing them up so they can be painted and put back together and hopefully put on 
the bike for the last time. Now while the rims are drying, I decided to go ahead and address this gas tank since I decided this is the one that I'm going to use. But it is very rusty on the inside. It's got a whole bunch of gobbledygook Marvel mystery oil and stuff that, have, that came back into it when I was trying to unlock the engine where it was seized up. The piston pushed it back up into the carb and just it, just, it was a big mess. So the first thing I'm going to do to this is just rinse it out with regular old water to try to get all the debris and everything out of it before I even do anything else. Just got this breather hose off of here and it is all messed up on the end so I'm just going to cut the bad part off. So now we got something to work with there. Alright, now I took the fuel line off of the carburetor and I'm going to stick it on here. So now I can clamp this off. And that'll keep my stuff from leaking out because I'm going to now fill the tank up with a mix of 25% muriatic acid and 75% water and let it just cook off all of that corrosion in there. All right, I've got a mixture here of muriatic acid and just regular old water. It's 75% uh, water, 25% muriatic acid. You want to be doing this in a well-ventilated area, which is why I'm outside. And you definitely want to be wearing some gloves. I'm just going to carefully start pouring this stuff in there. I'm just going to let that sit and cook for several hours and while it's doing its thing I'm going to go back and start working on those wheels again and get them completely finished up and on the bike. All right, I took the bearings out of these wheels for the process of painting. I didn't want to get any of the black paint on them so now I just need to get them pretty well lined up there and level. I've got a socket of just slightly smaller diameter than the bearing, and then just whap it. All right, that's completely seated all the way around. Now I just need to do that three more times. Oh, 
much faster. I got the back wheel on there. I cut out the spacers to go on either side to fill in the gap and get it in the center. Chains on. Now I just got to tend to the front wheel and make spacers for it. But first I need to get the wheel on there and take a couple measurements. All right, I got the front wheel on here, and for once, I actually got lucky. I just centered it up here, and I have several scrap pieces of this tubing laying around. And it just so happens that this piece fits perfectly right there, and this piece fits perfectly right here. I don't have to cut anything. It's a miracle. Well, the wheels have gone on for what will hopefully be the last time. So now I can turn my attention again to that gas tank. It's been sitting all day with that watered down muriatic acid in it and see if we can get it cleaned out because this is getting very close. Just need a f the fuel tank on there do something about the seat and hook a few things up here and there and we'll be riding. All right, I rinsed out the tank with water. I also mixed up some water and baking soda, like a couple teaspoons of it and put it in there and sloshed it around to help neutralize the muriatic acid. And there's still some surface rust. I'm sorry, there's still some pitting here and there, but the surface rust is now gone. I'm going to take this back off of here so that way I can blow some air through this and try to get all of the water out. And I'm going to try to create at least some kind of a seal around here, kind of. Bone dry. So I've just been sitting here kind of looking at the bike. And the more I look at it, I like it a lot from this side because you got the, the bare aluminum of the engine and everything's just all silvery colored. And when you come to this side, it looks like a boring old Predator engine and just black. And it's going to even look more black when I put the gas tank on there and the breather or air filter cover thingy that's black plastic. So I'm thinking about taking this tin off of there and spray painting it the same silver as I did on the front forks. Just to make it look a little cooler. Alright, I got it just kind of sitting back on there and just taking a look at it. Now I'm debating on whether or not to go ahead and spray this pull starter too. Of course, if I don't like it, I can always paint it back to black.
All right, I got all that put back together and I think I like it. It keeps it from just looking like some big black lump from this side. Uh, the logo on the engine is crooked now because I had to move the pull starter to a more comfortable position for the bike, but oh well. Now, let's see about getting a spring hooked up to this governor. So that way it pulls all the way into the off position whenever you let off the throttle and get the gas tank on there and hooked up. All right, I've got a spring here that I think might work. It's got a hole in either end. And for one side, I think I'll just put it on the bolt that goes through that holds the gas tank on and put the nut on there. And for this side, I think I'm just gonna bend a paper clip so it goes down into one of these holes on the governor arm. I think I'm going to have to shorten my spring. Because it needs to be about that taut. It's just a little too long and I don't want it, you know, attached to something crazy and ridiculous. So, I'm going to cut it off in about the middle and then just make a new loop on the end over here to attach to the bolt of the gas tank. All right, that pretty well ruined it, but now on the bright side, I have two springs instead of one. All right, so now I have a loop on the end, so I should be able to hook it around the bolt and then tighten everything down and it should hopefully stay put. So now all I need is the gas tank. Now I'll just get in here and take my spring and try to hook it to the gas tank bolt. Just like so. And then we'll tighten it down. Now, I want to address this thing because I don't want that whapping you in the leg or just being in the way. I mean, it sticks out like that because, you know, it's the throttle adjustment if you have this on a rototiller or a generator. But we don't need it, so I'm going to take the cutoff wheel and zizz it off of there. back on there all the hoses are hooked up got the air filter back on engine is tightened down went ahead and zip tied up the throttle cable to get it up and out of the way I've got the band brake completely back together and adjusted so I'm starting to run out of things to do, which is a good thing. Right now, though, I'm going to get these rear shocks back on here. All right, I'm gonna try holding this whole bolt from both sides with a pair of channel locks and try to keep it from spinning. And try to turn this with a wrench. Well, seems to be working a quarter turn at a time, so this will take just a, a second. <laughs> The rear shocks are both on, and this thing is getting real close to being finished. The end is definitely in sight. Now, the part I've been dreading, I have to do something for a seat, which 
I'm probably just going to take the old one and recover it and sew it by hand, which I'm sure is going to be absolutely thrilling. I'm going to reuse the same cushion, so the first thing I need to do is get this old crusty cover off of here. some measurements off of this. Looking like about... I'll just use the base to go by. 10 inches wide in the back. Uh, about seven and a half, nah. Seven and a quarter in the front. I should probably write this down. It is just a hair under 12 inches long. And it's about four uh, to the edge, I'd say three, three inches high. So we'll go four and a half to have plenty to wrap underneath. All right. I do have some vinyl that I bought that is pretty thin that looks like I could actually sew it by hand without just pushing the needle through my thumb. So that's next on the agenda. All right, I got my piece of vinyl here. So now we're going to do some measuring and mark how we need to cut this thing out. So we know that it needs to be about four and a half inches tall. We're going to come out four and a half inches. And then we know it's 10 inches wide at the back. So, from four and a half, we're going to come out 10 to 14 and a half. Go ahead and just make another four and a half inch mark here. So that gives us our side edge to work with. So we just kind of work inside this square and pretend that the outer edge doesn't exist. All right. Come out four and a half. Let's connect those. All right, and that gives us enough to come down the seat and then fold under. And we know the seat's 12 inches long, so 12 would be here, but we need to go four and a half on top of 12 to have enough to fold under. So that gives us 16 and a half. Sixteen and a half. Join these two. Alright. And we know that it's going to be 10 inches wide at the back. So we'll put a mark at 10. And we know it's going to be seven and a quarter in the front, but we need that seven and a quarter not to be shifted that way. We need it to shift over this way. So half of seven and a quarter, or actually no, we need to figure out the difference between seven and a quarter and ten, which is two and three quarters, and half of that is an inch and three eighths. So from Measure up 12, because that's how long the seat is. Put a mark there. We'll do another one there. I'll just connect the 
these two. And so now we just need to come over an inch and three eighths, which is right there. And then from there, we do our seven and a quarter, which is right here. So now connect these two, the 10 inch mark over here and the seven and a quarter. We'll do the same on this side, from this corner right here where these lines intersect to that seven and a quarter. And that gives us our seating surface with enough overhang all the way around to fold under. So now all I need to do is put a line here out the four and a half that we said. And then even there, come out four and a quarter, I'm sorry, four and a half. Connect these two. All right, and that should be it. Did you follow all of that? I don't blame you if you didn't. All right, so we have our seating surface. We have our overhang in the front, overhang in the sides overhang in the back. So now I'm just going to go ahead and get this square cut out of here. All right. And I got a bunch of vinyl left over for a future project. Well, we can just take our seat and it should line up pretty well with the marks we made in the middle of this and it does. So now we just got to figure out how to make our cuts at the corners. So this could be folded over like so. And then this part to be able to flap underneath here. So we have to make cuts to allow for that. And then they'll be sewn together from the inside out. So that way when you flip it in, or right side in, you don't see the, the stitches. They're tucked inside. All right, so we're gonna be cutting a line straight out from these two points so that can fold this way. So just from that point there, Make a couple lines to follow. And I will be the first to admit that I had no idea how to sew or do any of this stuff. I'm literally making it up as I go along. So if it works, great. If it doesn't, don't say I didn't tell you so. Okay, so now we're just gonna go ahead and make these cuts. flap to go here so it's looking like I just need to make a cut straight out and just get rid of this square when it's sewn together it'll be done from the inside out and it'll be a matter of taking these two edges and just folding them together like that and sewing along that seam so that when you flip it inside out you have a, a edge like that. 
That's the plan anyway. All right, so basically I just need to do that exact same thing on the other three corners. All right, so now there is our pattern. And I'm probably gonna sew this inside in the recliner in front of the TV, so BRB. And 30 minutes later, I have a seat cover of some sorts. I just had it inside out and then just held these edges together and then just sewed along them so then you can flip it the right way out and you get kind of a seam like that not too bad for a little mini back anyway now the real moment of truth here I think I can get that all stapled down and it's not going to be too terrible. All right, I think she's done. Homemade seat and all. And I uh, will probably spare you the grunting and groaning of trying to get this thing down off of this stand now because I've just pretty much got to heave ho it and pick it up and lift it off. So that'll be fun. All right, I aired up the tires, I put a little gas in it, and nothing left to do than to take our first test ride. Well, that was a informative first ride. Let's see, a couple things I've learned is the band brake really needs to be tightened up. It slows you down, but it doesn't do much for stopping you. Uh, the wheels are a little scary. Uh, when you start to get up some momentum and get this thing up to speed, which I am hesitant to do just because the wheels are so uh, dicey. It gets uh, pretty hairy kind of anxiety inducing. I would not dare get it up to top speed with the wheels that are on it. And I need to remove at least a link, maybe two, out of the chain because there at the very end it 
popped off on me. Other than that, it seems to work okay. And I think I probably will revisit this sometime in the future. And especially if I can get a hold of some bigger, nicer wheels to go on there for sure. Maybe soup up the exhaust. Uh, do a little tweaks here and there, kind of make it road worthy as far as getting it up to top speed and make a video of that. But for now, I think that's going to wrap this one up. Maybe next time we'll work on something bigger. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you already haven't. Hit the notification bell. So that way YouTube notifies you every time I upload a new video. And until next time, I'll see you then.